of Seven Fallen Feathers. And so it's uh, it's my honor that he's here today um, to uh, to be chatting with me. And I have to say as well that Tisa Fiddler was also a very big help to me. And when I put the book together, you know, she is such an incredible resource as a teacher, as a friend, as an Anishinaabe Kwe, and um, who's someone who has had lived experience, as has Alvin. Their experience has been different from mine because I did not grow up in community. My mother and my mother's family um, is from Fort William First Nation, and uh, I know you know all know where that is. I was raised, though, in Toronto. My father is, well, he was, he passed away um, 20 years ago, but he was Polish. And I grew away from, I was raised outside of community. Um, you know, I always knew that my mom was Ojibwe. I always knew that I was a First Nations person. But when you grow up in Toronto, outside of Toronto, actually, outside of community, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough as a child going to school to see yourself reflected into the faces of everyone else. Um, when I was growing up in Toronto in the 70s and the 80s, um, I went to school and I didn't learn anything about our people. I didn't learn anything about Indian residential school. I actually thought that as a child that every everyone had parents or grandparents or friends or cousins that went to the schools. I thought that was normal. Um, I didn't realize that I was different from um, from everyone else that way. But as I got older, I started to realize that. And I was a journalist. I still am a journalist. Um, I focus primarily now on book writing. But for a long time, I worked at the Toronto Star. And when I started at the Star, I started to do everything. I was a general reporter. I covered crime and politics, um, health care. And it was when I was sent to Queen's Park in about 2008 that I saw an opportunity for me to start writing about First Nations issues in this province because not a lot of people were writing about it. Um, a lot of editors didn't want stories on First Nations people. You know, the occasional story was fine, um, the occasional feature, but not a whole uh, litany of stories of all the things that I saw and was seeing. Um, and so when in 2011 I went to uh, Thunder Bay um, to do a story on why it is Indigenous people don't vote in federal elections, um, that my eyes were truly opened to what was going on in the North when it comes to education and when it comes to the fact that our children are having to utter and think about the sentence that education and death can be in the same sentence. You know, our students have to go away from their homes and their communities just to get a high school education, which is a fundamental right of every other child in this country. Our children have to go so much further away from everything, all the people they know from their language. It's a really tough thing. And the more I was researching it, the more I was finding out about what was happening in Thunder Bay and what was happening with the seven students, the more I realized that a book needed to be written um, because it wasn't going to be adequate enough for me to get the message out of what was happening in the North just through newspaper articles. We needed something different, something that we could all work on together. And I always say that many hands help to write Seven Fallen Feathers, and that's very true. And those hands are Alvin, those hands are Tisa, um, Sam Ashley Paneskum, uh, an elder that uh, is very close to my heart and who I work with, um, the families of the seven, the friends of the seven. Um, this is all of our stories, all put into one. And this is the story of Canada. This is the story of how this country was made. It's a story of colonization and of racism. And it's a story that we all still live every single day. So I'm always grateful when I see that people have taken the book, that teachers have taken it amongst themselves to teach this book, because it is so important. You know, when Premier Ford was um, elected two years ago, he could have made it so that 
indigenous education, indigenous story history was made mandatory in high schools, but sadly it was made a choice. Um, so it's up to teachers right now to take this forward, to take us forward, to introduce students to the true history of this country. And I'm always, always heartened when I see um, groups like yours and groups across the country of teachers that are taking Seven Fallen Feathers, that are taking all our relations and books by other authors, books by Richard Wagamese, books by Alicia Elliott, and they are being taught time and time again because we can't wait for change to happen. Um, if you wait, that's like being indifferent and indifference can kill. Indifference hurts and harms. Teachers need to be proactive and that's what you're doing. And you know, I'm just gonna take it forward a little bit with what's been going on now with um, the demonstrations we've seen across Turtle Island. I think this is a moment too that teachers can start pushing again for curriculum changes and for perhaps Premier Doug Ford to make those changes. So our history is mandatory in all of our high schools. Um, you know, everyone right now, there's a moment of people sort of scrambling around trying to figure out how to make things better, how to improve things just a little bit. I think that's one change that we can do here in this province that will take us forward. Um, I want uh, Alvin to sort of jump in and talk about his own experiences um, as well. Uh, and then I'm totally happy to answer any questions that you have later on um, in our remaining time. Alvin, the floor is yours. <coughs> okay, uh, miigwech. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Tanya. Uh, miigwech, uh, Jordi, for inviting me to be uh, part of this very uh, important uh, conversation. Hello to all of you that are on the line. Uh, I'm in Thunder Bay uh, today in the beautiful uh, territory of the Robinson Superior and Schneebe people. Um, but I'm not from Thunder Bay. Uh, I'm from a small community uh, in northwest Ontario called Musquatam. It's a small, one of the smallest communities in the Nishtabaskation territory. And uh, when I was born in the summer of uh, July of uh, July of 1966, I was born at a, an Indian hospital in Sulakout. And uh, later on that summer, uh, my family, along with uh, maybe three or four other families, moved to this place uh, called Wajashkudigabik in Dam, which was about 50 miles up the Severn River. We were in Berskin Lake uh, uh, originally, but then we moved. Uh, so I was about three weeks old when my parents took me to this place. There was just bush there. We lived in a tent for a bit, and then my dad quickly built a log cabin before winter came, and uh, that's where uh, I grew up. Uh, a small, a small place, but a really beautiful uh, place. And like all small communities in that territory, uh, once we uh, built a school there, and once uh, my community got reserve status uh, ten years later in 1976, uh, it only goes up to uh, grade eight. So when I was, uh, I think I turned, uh, <clears throat> I think I, yeah, I turned 14 that summer, and uh, 19. 80 and uh, I had to leave my community to go to high school and I went to Sulacote. I lived uh, at a residence uh, in Pelican Falls uh, Center but I went to high school in Sulacote so they would bus us every day to go to a, a, a public high school in Sulacote and then when I um, reached grade 12 I decided to uh, moved to a bigger town, uh, which was here in Thunder Bay, and uh, that's where I finished my my high school <clears throat> uh, here in Thunder Bay uh, when I was, uh, I think, 17, or I, I turned 18 when I graduated. Um, so when I, uh, when we moved here, uh, my wife, Fatisa, and I, we moved to Thunder Bay um, in 1998. Um, Pelican or uh, uh, DFC, Del Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School had just opened up uh, or, or it opened up two years later or a year later, uh, a year and a half later. And uh, that very first year, 
uh, that had opened up that fall. Uh, that's when we uh, lost our first uh, high school student, at least from the Nantes Territory. Uh, that was Jethro Anderson. Just uh, a little over a month into uh, uh, that term in, in the fall, uh, he went missing. And we didn't know where he was for many days. And then uh, we started looking uh, for him. Uh, and then uh, he, and I remember uh, uh, Tisa and I, uh, and we had just uh, a little baby then, who was uh, probably three or four months old. We, we went there. We would go to the river where we thought he was. And I remember how cold it was and just how um, <clears throat> hard it was for those of us that were looking for him. And, and then uh, a year later, we lost another student and then another and then another and i think that's when i started to make inquiries about why is this happening uh, reggie bushy from popper hill uh drowned in uh 2007 and i remember um standing uh by the the waterway uh where the police were searching. And I remember getting a call from Tisa, who was a teacher at the time at the uh, DFC, telling me that um, Reggie's parents were on their way from Pauper Hill. And I remember telling her very clearly, uh, this was on November 1st, I remember the day because it was after Halloween. It was so peaceful, it was like a fall day. And I remember telling Tisa that, you know what, if they're gonna find um, Jethro or if they're gonna find uh, Reggie, uh, they're gonna find him today. And sure enough, uh, his body was found uh, probably two hours later. And that's when we started to really uh, make inquiries about why is this happening? Like there has to be, uh, because there was no outcry. It was like nobody knew what was going on. And then that's when we started to make inquiries about or to uh, ask uh, the province uh, to hold an inquiry. And they didn't do it right away. You know, we had to lose more yeah. kids, including uh, um, Cal Morso, the grandson of, uh, of Norval. Um, and then he had to lose his life too, uh, a year or two later before an inquiry was, was held. And um, I think, uh, I think that's why I've been so passionate about uh, doing this work because uh, I was one of those kids. You know, I was one of those kids here in Thunder Bay trying to find uh, a place in the community and trying to find a place in school. And, you know, I, along with uh, my partner, Tisa, I it was one of the most passionate educators that I know. Uh, you know, I think that's why we've been so involved in this work and so committed to uh, making things better for our students. And unfortunately, uh, many of our students still have to leave because many of the schools uh, in the Nantes Territory uh, only go up to grade eight. Uh, and many of them have to leave to go to uh, Timmins or Sulacote or Thunder Bay uh, and other places to get, get their schooling past uh, grade eight. So um, that's our reality. And as you know, Indigenous education uh, generally has always been just severely underfunded. Just you know, when you talk about uh, just inequities, and you can find it pretty much anywhere, uh, whether it's a child welfare system or education. And uh, I, I think that's why I, I really appreciate the the work that's being done by this group. That uh, you know, I think it's going to take all of us to uh, begin to fix. Uh, what's been broken for a long time, and uh, um, that's why I think I'm so committed to be a part of this, uh, to be a part of this effort. And I regret that I was uh, Tisa was here, but unfortunately she couldn't join us. I hope she's not. Uh, maybe I'm not sure if she's listening in, but uh, <laughs> sure. uh, anyway, I look forward to your comments and your questions, and just to engage in the conversation. I have my coffee, I have my <laughs> my my tea here. Uh, and just to look forward to being part of this very important conversation. So again, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me uh, this afternoon.
So I just want to remind everyone, um, just to kind of interject here, there was a there seems to be a lag, and now it seems like people are are coming back into the meeting. I think uh, um, maybe part of the issue was everyone trying to log in at once. I'm not sure, but uh, just for those who have joined us, if you can make sure your mute your audio your mute is you're muted, your audio button is off, and that you're not on video. And also, you'll notice. Uh, if you hover over either Tanya or Elvin's screen, there's three little dots. And if you click on that, you can pin the person to the front of your screen when they're talking, just as a little tip for you there. But um, as we continue now on with the conversation, um, maybe if you can talk a little bit about... Um, I know that for in our board, we actually we run an, an AQ course and we the part one is actually we use your book, Tanya. Um, it's a required reading for um, educators. And I don't know if you can share a little bit about um, what's happened since um, writing the book. And I know that you have a another book that you've published since then that dives into um, some of the other issues yeah. yeah so if you want to maybe comment about has any has has there been any improvements or um uh, what's happened since then um sure i can i can speak to that a little bit and then i'm going to turn that over to uh grand chief fiddler because he's uh uh, he can give you a, a, a better answer than than I can. I'll just give it to you from from my view. Um, I was very heartened to see that uh, Matawa, the school that Jordan Wabas went to, was completely revamped, has completely changed, has a brand new facility that is absolutely stunning. You would remember from Seven Fallen Feathers, I spoke of um, the school that Jordan went to and how it was in an office building, this sort of low, decrepit office building, um, and how there was no um, there was no park for the kids, there was no green space, it was just a parking lot, and how they were having a lot of problems. That school now is doing so well, and I had the opportunity to tour the school um, with all of the changes that have happened since the inquest due to um, funding mechanisms that have come to the school. And it's remarkable. Um, it's a beautiful facility with an absolutely massive track. There's an outdoor learning spot so you can learn from the land. Um, there's so much love in that school. And there is a residence now for up to 100 students that should be open soon if it's not open already. Um, you know, I have to tell you that when I walked through the halls of that school when I was first there, um, it was really bittersweet for me. I, was, um, I thought it was incredible, but I also cried, you know, um, thinking of all that we, we have lost and the fact that all of our children do not have this opportunity. And what really did it for me, I got to tell you, was um, there was a door open near the gym and um, inside of that that room, there was a room and it was full of hockey equipment. It was full of brand new hockey equipment, brand new goalie pads and sticks and skates. And Jordan was a goalie, he was a champion goalie. And I just kept on thinking, you know, all of our kids should have this, all of our kids should have this. Move over to Dennis Franklin Camardi High School, which has, um, or six of the seven fallen feathers were students. Dennis Franklin has um, has many challenges and needs to be funded exactly like Matawa has been funded. Um, we need to get there. We need a safe space for all of our students in Thunder Bay. Um, there has been some changes since the book was published, since the inquest finished. People are now talking about what's happening People weren't talking about it before. It's like Alvin mentioned, so, you know, there was there was nothing. And that was one thing that I kept uh, as a journalist um, and as a, an Anishinaabe Quay. Like, you know, how did I not know about this where I'm living in Toronto? It's because I live here. Um, how did I not know that so many of our kids were, were dying to get an education? Why weren't people caring and talking about it? Where were the satellite trucks and the news trucks? 
I think that's changed. I think there's a focus now on Thunder Bay. Um, the Globe and Mail has um, has made a commitment to tell stories about what's going on in Thunder Bay, and everyone across Canada is now talking about it. Um, but Thunder Bay itself is a long way to go. Um, and sadly, our, our children are still dying to get services in Thunder Bay. Our people are. And um, I will turn that over to Alvin. So if I understand correctly, the question was about what changes have we seen in the last... In Thunder Bay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would just say that uh, um, there's been some change. I don't think we're moving fast enough. Uh, you know, the, the recommendations that came out from the inquest, for example, uh, this was four years ago. Uh, we're still struggling to uh, come up with a, a plan that will see uh, all these uh, recommendations uh, implemented. And we have a table with Ontario and Canada and other agencies and officials uh, for us to, to do this. We were supposed to have a meeting uh, this month. Uh, in Casa Monica, which was the home of Jethro Anderson, uh, to continue this work. Um, but uh, uh, now that we're uh, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, I don't see that as an excuse to for the work to stop. I think we still need to uh, keep moving forward. That's the message I always convey to uh, whether it's the provincial education minister or uh, Minister Mark Miller, that you still need to direct your officials to uh, make sure that they uh, work on a plan that will see full implementation of all these uh, of all these uh, recommendations. And uh, if you walk through the halls of DFC, I think there's been some change. It's, it seems to be more um, uh, like a high school, like a regular high school. And uh, uh, just a side story here with our daughter Allison, who is 15. You know, a, a kid who's been in the Catholic school board all her life. Uh, you know, we asked her, where, you know, where she would like to go this, like in the fall, last fall, like this current uh, school year that's ending now. She said, I wanted to go to, I want to go to uh, DFC. And you know, she lo she loves it there. You know, there, it's a safe space uh, with the elders there. There's lots of uh, traditional sort of programming, cultural um, programming that is incorporated incorporated to the curriculum and uh, she's yeah she's just she doesn't want to come home after school <laughs> that's how much she, she likes it there and uh you know but we still need to do lots of work uh, to really uh make it uh i think the uh, in terms of um standards in terms of uh the curriculum that uh, that needs to be developed uh, we're still a ways and also the the safety piece that uh, Tanya talked about, uh, you know, there's still no residents for uh, DFC, um, and that's something we're still working on uh, to make sure that there's proper infra infrastructure uh, to support our students uh, that come that come out to high school. So I'm just going to remind people that you're welcome to use the chat box to ask questions, Dad? and. Mm -hmm. And Alvin's just going to be a parent for a moment. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> that's all good. That's our reality, working from home. Um, so I, um, I think Tanya, I don't know if it was just you or maybe you and Alvin mess, uh, talked about how no one was really talking about this until fairly recently. And it reminded me of the importance of awareness and how we in education can bring about awareness simply awareness not necessarily i think people sometimes jump to the need to provide a solution but mm -hmm. even just to spend time around the awareness piece and it reminded me of when the government first announced that they were what they called putting a pause <laughs> on the curriculum revisions stemming from the truth and reconciliation commission and just for those who are listening, in the event that you're not, I think everybody's aware of it now, but just in case you're not, those the TRC um, stated that now it's mandatory that everyone is now learning, therefore all teachers must be teaching K to 12 and post-secondary um, 
is now bringing in Indigenous people's histories, perspectives, contributions into the classroom. And they decided to do this in a phased approach. Phase one was completed, which was now there's changes to the grades four to eight curriculum, as well as grade 10 history. Then the government changed, a pause was announced. We're still, here we are several years later, still on pause. And, um, but I did notice that there was this outpouring of social media and it picked up a hashtag teachers for TRC. And I have to, I was surprised because you know, when you're, you know, I saw on my cell phone notifications, the media, you know, you get the media news and all of the outlets had kind of picked up on this. And it was really a first that mainstream media was picking up and it was, you know, due to the fact that so many teachers were using just a simple hashtag um, to bring awareness to this. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can, you know, if you've noticed an uptake in terms of, because of course your book really brought to the forefront um, in such a powerful way, what was happening in Thunder Bay. And I think that also gave people a bit of a, um, you know, to see that it's not, happening outside of Ontario. This is happening and not just in Thunder Bay either. This is this is not a unique issue. Um, this is happening across our province. So if maybe if you want to comment on the impacts that the importance of having more voices to help bring around this awareness piece. Mm -hmm. um, it means a lot, you know, um, the, the great thing about um, about Seven Fallen Feathers um, is that teachers associations uh, and unions and schools across Canada are teaching it, they're reading it. Um, I think that's really incredible, you know, and all the places that I visit and I, I've gotten to, um, to, to speak to many teachers associations, um, BC, Alberta, Calgary, Vancouver, um, Kamloops, and, um, Every place that I go, you know, I find out more and I learn more about what the education systems are like there. And in northern BC, you have the same thing. You have children leaving to get an education. In northern Alberta, it's the same thing. In northern Manitoba, it's the same thing. Northern Saskatchewan, I mean, time and time again, we see um, our kids being moved, you know, 100, 200, 600 kilometers away. Uh, when they're 12, 13, 14, 15 to go to school, like on their own. You know, Alvin talked to you about his experience. Um, can you imagine, like, you know, can you imagine doing that now? Sending your, your child out to, to go to school away from you, away from your language, everything. Um, and I think when, when the beauty of telling the story of Seven Fallen Feathers is people understand that. Um, people understand that the seven children were children. They each had futures and they each had possibility, right? Um, people have to stop seeing us as statistics. They have to stop seeing us as headlines. Um, and oftentimes that is often what gets in the news, you know, headlines on how many suicides have been in a community or, um, or women that go missing. People need to know that we have futures, that we have possibility. And it's to Canada's detriment that we are not supported and encouraged. And I think that teachers can do a lot. I mean, teachers are the change makers, right? I mean, um, Senator Murray Sinclair often will say, education very much got us in this mess. And he's referring to the Indian residential school system but he always says education will get us out of it. So by teachers being active on social media, being active in their own families, um, being active in groups or with their friends, standing up and saying something, um, change comes in slowly, yes, but change comes in small ways and in big ways too. Thank you. Elvin, do you wanna to add to that at all? Uh, with uh, everything that uh, Tanya just said, uh, you know, education is so important um, to uh, 
you know, it's, I think, the key in terms of how we're going to make things better for our communities. And I had an opportunity to, uh, at a coffee shop in Solok out there a couple of years ago, or about a year and a half ago, to sit down with the minister. And I forget her name, the the the, the, the previous education minister. Uh, somebody help me out here. What was her name? Thompson. Th Lisa Thompson. Lisa, was I think it? was her. Yeah. That was her. <clears throat> I think her name was Lisa Thompson, or her name is Lisa Thompson. Yeah. Thompson, who was the education minister, and she was up in Silico for the opening of the new high school there um, about a year ago, year and a half ago. And uh, yeah. we were having tea at the airport in Silico, and I sat with her and I said, you know, of all the ministers, the cabinet ministers in, the, in this government, I said, you have the most important job, you know, which is education. You know, you're in charge of all these schools and school boards and kids, you know, and you need to. My point to her was that uh, I wanted her to do a good job. And I said, and they just said, I said, who's your advisor on Indigenous education? And she said, nobody. She said, you need to get an advisor that's going to help you uh, make sure that you're able to to do your job in a good way. And Unfortunately, that didn't happen. She moved on. Now we have another education minister that uh, I'm not sure how. I hope he's committed to indigenous education, uh, but we haven't seen it. As Tanya mentioned, that there's been um, delays. There's been uh, work that was stopped on um, curriculum writing, for example, uh, whether it was at TRC and then there was uh, another project that we were involved in, which uh, was uh, through Secret Path. And uh, it's 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 frustrating when we, you know, have momentum, and then it stops, and then nothing happens, and and then we're trying to restart uh, the process again. It's uh, I know it's frustrating for you, as educators. It's frustrating frustrating for us as leaders to try and convince uh, governments uh, right now with this uh, conservative uh, uh, government uh, in the province to do the right thing. It's just to me, it's pretty easy, but for some reason, you know, people just, you know, there's a, always that resistance and we need to break that. I'm glad that you mentioned that about how do we keep momentum? Um, because, you know, we know as educators in the ground, we, if we wait for the government, uh, we will never see things change. So we do have as teachers flexibility when we look at our curriculum. Um, there's lots of opportunity to be teaching this um, without without ministry curriculum being very explicit saying you must teach this. So we don't have to wait for explicit curriculum. There's <coughs> there's lots of opportunities to be doing this. And I think, you know, for those who are listening, I want you to think about how can you in your capacity, whether it's a classroom teacher, a system leader, an administrator, whatever it is that your capacity is, what is it that you can do? Everyone can do something. So how do we, you know, continue to to do the right thing and and use our voices collectively to continue to put pressure on the ministry to, you know, why are we still paused on that? Um, but if we if we keep the pressure on you know, then hopefully there'll be, um, you know, some responses coming. I have noticed the minister has made some interesting uh, photo ops and choice of what's in his background. I'm not sure if you've seen any of those. He's had a headdress in the background of one, a dream catcher in the other. I'm not sure if that's his way of saying I'm committed. Uh, <laughs> it's a very bizarre. But, you know, these are important moments i think that we are are looking to how do we keep this going in our in our everyday classrooms so i'm going to turn now to the chat box we have questions coming in which is great uh the first one here is uh tanya what is your next writing project Ooh, let's see the ancient cadbury secret right that's <laughs> um well before um before my next book comes out, um, I'm actually have a podcast series that's coming out um, and it's called Seven Truths. Um, it's for Audible, so Amazon, um, and it'll be out in probably late September, early October. 
Um, and it's on, it's all original, it's writing, it's journalism, it's um, on the seven grandfather teachings. And I take each teaching and tell a contemporary story through each teaching. And um, also a part of the podcast is, um, is Sam Ashley Penenskum. And so he is speaking actually, and he tells each of the seven teachings um, in our language. And um, he is throughout the, the podcast. So there's a language component to this and um, there are a lot of truths to it as well. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that coming out because it's a new medium for me. Uh, it's, it's storytelling, it's oral storytelling, um, and it's also journalism and language. So that's first. And then uh, a next, my next book will be out late 2021. And I can't tell you what that's on yet. Such a teaser. Good, great. <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> Um, the next question is, and I might modify it a bit. The question is, how would you recommend building learning partnerships with elders in, it says, in our community? Um, maybe to comment maybe the, more about the importance and the critical need to do that in terms of building partnerships with community. Mm -hmm. um, Alvin, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, thank you for the, the question. I, um, what I would say uh, you know, about that is uh, it's important that the elders be part of the education system in this province. Um, but it has to be more than just giving them tobacco. You know, you need to properly compensate them uh, for their valuable contribution uh, to the education uh, system or systems in this province. Uh, many of them uh, went through the Indian residential school, school system. And uh, I was thinking here in, in Thunder Bay, you know, Tisa works with uh, this elder, uh, Felicia, who went to residential school for almost 10 years. And she's such a valuable resource, uh, not just to her, but to the teachers, to the school board, to the students. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I would just encourage other school boards in the province to uh, go out there and uh, uh, establish those relationships, uh, knowing that every year we lose many of these IRS survivors. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, while they are still alive, I would just encourage uh, the school boards right across uh, the province, even the Ministry of, Ministry of Education, uh, to incorporate uh, their knowledge uh, into the curriculum uh, right across the board. Thank you. Tanya, do you want to add to any of that? Um, it's beautifully said, you know, um, it's a small change. It needs to be done though. You know, our elders need to be on school boards. Our people need to be on school boards too. When you look at the uh, the fact that so many of our kids go to public schools and Catholic schools, and then you look at the makeup of who's on the boards of those uh, um, <coughs> schools, there are no Indigenous people on school boards. It's it's really hard to find. Um, that needs to change too, because that also directs funding. It directs policy. Um, it everyone it keeps our issues at top of mind and it we should be part of the provincial education system that way because there are so many kids like me that went through the system you know and never saw themselves reflected anywhere um and, you know especially if you grow up without your community you don't see yourself reflected in your students you don't see yourself reflected in your teachers um your principals the books nothing that has to change so I, and I echo everything that Alvin said, and we have to stop, you know, inviting our elders in and giving them a mug or giving them some tobacco. Um, elders often too won't uh, ask to be compensated, but they should be um, for their experience and for um, all that they've done. And I have to say, you know, um, I did notice there are, I noticed there was one elder on the call. Um, where did he go? 
Um, I, I, we met at uh, Niagara District School Board um, where I've been given a series of talks. Um, Telehante, he's there. His knowledge is fantastic. We need elders in the classrooms, on the school boards, in the schools. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. There's a, you know, a slogan, nothing about us without us. And I, I really want to echo that if, if people aren't aware that every school board is supposed to have an Indigenous Education Council and our board has moved now from going from an advisory role to now um, it's now part of board governance. So we pass policy to ensure that. I don't know if that's Alvin. Hey. How are you? <laughs> you Alvin. There we go. <laughs> um, and yeah, and the other thing I want to um, really emphasize that you've brought up is that people are properly compensated. So when you bring in, you know, a math a math expert, for example, to provide some professional development or whatever, you know, how we treat other people in 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 the land of academia, uh, we should be doing the same for knowledge holders because, like you said, our elders have have knowledge that you can't find anywhere else in books or um, you know, and and it also and I and I also want to bring up. Um, that Canada is now a signatory to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And by the fact that Canada is a signatory to that, it does have, um, it does have importance bearing on our own laws and our approaches to how we're doing education. And part of, part of that UNDRIP is ensuring as Indigenous peoples, we have the right to exercise control and see education as as we see fit, and that includes our languages as well. Um, so I just wanted to add that in as you were uh, commenting on that, that um, that we look at, that we take a good look at how do those Indigenous education councils run? Who's who's on them? Are all voices heard and um, you know, and same with at the ministry. Don't assume that because the ministry puts out curriculum, it's necessarily been done in the right way. We have to always be holding, you know, those high accountabilities in place because we know um, that the that those those voices are not getting to the right tables. Okay, so going back to the questions here. Uh, Okay, so there's a question around families that are housing students. Um, I think it's in Thunder Bay that they meant to say. Uh, is there, um, are there programs or uh, um, assistance for families that house students in Thunder Bay to make sure, I guess they wanna know a little bit about the process around when kids are, are housed outside of their communities, how that works. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to leave that for Alvin. Uh, yeah, so he's got a student at DEFC too. <laughs> yeah, uh, so there's there's been some like investments made over the last uh, three years uh, to try to uh, build wraparound supports on students uh, in Thunder Bay. Uh, three years ago, um, there were two tragic deaths involving young people and Tanya I wrote about that in her one of her books I think that was sort of how she started that that book um, involving a young girl who was in the child welfare system uh, and also a young boy who was in in Thunder Bay uh, to seek uh, mental health supports and counseling uh, and they disappeared the same night they went missing the same night and uh, uh, the young girl was found a couple of days later uh, down by the river. And then a, a, a few days later, a young boy was found again in the water, in the same uh, same waterway. And uh, there was just, uh, there's just, there was a lot of fear. Like it was real. Uh, people or families wanted to pull out their students. They, they said, we're not gonna send our students back to Thunder Bay in the fall. 
And I didn't blame them. I, I would probably would have made the same decision. So we called for an emergency chiefs meeting and we had it at the DFC gym for two days or three days. And we had government people there. We had uh, representatives from different school boards and everyone committed to uh, investing into supports, additional supports for uh, our students. And uh, the first year after that, there was a, a decrease in number of students that came to Thunder Bay. But I think the more that they saw there were supports, uh, there were more students that came back. Uh, you know, in year two, now year three, it's, it's I think it's it's full capacity in both Admatawa uh, and DFC and other high schools here in Thunder Bay. So uh, again, I tell government people that you cannot just have, make these one-time investments, that this has to be part of their education journey while they're in high school, no matter what, where they are, that they need, if they don't have parents, if they don't have their family, you need, we need to create those supports for them that will be with them 24-7. And uh, I think we, we've uh, achieved that to some degree, but uh, I, I always fear that they're going to cut back. And that's something that uh, I always say, we cannot cut back. In fact, we need to keep increasing these investments to make sure that they not only are kept safe, but that they succeed, that they're able to move beyond high school to go to college or, or university. Thank you. Tanya, do you want to add to any of that? Uh, no, just um, I would echo everything the Grand Chief said. Um, it's not time to cut back. It's time to invest and uh, not to make it a program, make it permanent funding. Um, because when things are programs, uh, you get funding for one year, two years, and then government change and your funding's gone. You know, it's got to be built into the system as it stands. Thank you. Um, another question is in regards to, I'm going to try and sum it up a little bit, in regards to uh, bringing in teaching Indigenous education in classrooms. And this question is in regards to, is there advice on how to bring this into a preschooler program? So just before kindergarten, um, how to bring in these perspectives, uh, whether it be stories or just Indigenous knowledge. Your thoughts on that? Mm. Hmm. That's a, that's so, a so this is where uh, Tisha would come in. And, uh, <laughs> that's right. Out of the ballpark. I know that's true. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think you know um, one of the things that uh, one of the the programs that is available in some communities is the Head Start program, and uh, again, the, the these are sort of proposal driven programming like the funding they're not made available to every community and uh, i was very fortunate uh, when i was working up in muskwadan that we were able to uh, get uh, approval to actually build a facility and have these little tiny children come into the and they have one here in thunder bay as well uh, it's called school day head start um, and it's it's great like it's uh, it's not a it's not a babysitting service but you actually develop curriculum and uh, incorporating language and culture uh, into uh, into these programs, and uh, you know, both our kids who are now teenagers went to Head Start, and uh, I can I could tell that they really enjoyed that. They really benefited from that, and I think we need to have this again right across the board. Not just uh, you know just because you write an awesome proposal that you get approved, it, it should be. Uh, made available to every community uh, in the region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Alvin, do you want to comment about um, your own experience growing up with family on the land and with the language, and why that's so so important? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was I was pretty lucky. I care about very lucky. Uh, person in so many ways that not, a, not only am I married to an awesome person, but just how I was raised, as I said earlier, that my uh, parents took me 
to this place when I was just a baby, and that's uh, to begin a new community. That's where I grew up, and my dad taught me, you know, just how to how to garden, how to you know go fishing. And my mom taught me how to. Uh, you know, my mom was a healer, and just the medicines and the importance of um, incorporating our own gifts to and and, and using our own gifts to uh, sustain ourselves and. And that's how I grew up in the, in the language and just uh, family, uh, not just my immediate family, but, uh, you know, it's like your, your uncles or your, your other parents or your aunties, they're, you know, they're like your parents as well. And just uh, the love and support from all that, it really uh, helped me in my own, uh, in my own journey. And that's something that, uh, uh, that every child should have. And, um, Again, that's part of the work that we're doing now with uh, with the Choose Life Initiative is we want to make sure that uh, children are able to uh, go to the land uh, for land-based uh, healing and land-based uh, education. Uh, Choose Life uh, provides that. That's something that we're hoping will uh, remain in place uh, moving forward on a permanent basis. Thank you. Tanya, do you want to add anything? Um I agree, you know, Choose Life is an incredible program and it needs uh, to be a permanent fixture. The Head Start program as well. Um, and at the, you know, I, I, I wish I knew more about preschool education um, so I could talk about it uh, a little bit more um, earnestly, but um, there are things that you can do, you know, you bring in um, music, bring in songs. Um, you know, teach the Ojibwe language or teach the language uh, what school you're in, uh, what nation you happen to be on, you know, start looking at the history of that nation, that school, bring in language, bring in speak to, you know, and, and it has to be there. Like change your, um, change your focus uh, when it comes to um, um, field trips too. You know, I remember being in grade, was it seven or eight? and going to St. Marie Among the Hurons in Penetanguishene and being horrified. It was like this pioneer camp that we had to live there for three days and around the Black Creek Pioneer Village. And that was like, that's the history I got, you know, and it was, I felt, I, I remember I didn't sleep for three days. We camped out there. Um, it was just awful and it was so uncomfortable. Um, sort of rethink your as teachers too, where you're taking the kids on field trips and take them out onto the land. Nan does this incredible um, program, um, taking the kids moose hunting every September. It's a, it's a way to connect. Um, preschools, you probably want to do that. Do something else. Go pick medicine, traditional medicine. Go look at traditional gardens. Um, Think about food, about the food we eat and what is traditional to that land and to that First Nation. Um, there's lots that can be done. And also to reading this book, oh, since we happen to be, I happen to have it right here, The Water Walker. That should be in every single classroom as well by um, Joanne Robertson. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, such a good reminder. You know, it makes me also think about when we talk about education K to 12, it's, um, you know, it's, it's about readiness and, um, and what's appropriate. So, you know, for the kindergartens or primaries, you know, how we, what we're teaching them is going to look very, very different than what we're going to be teaching in, you know, getting into secondary level, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned that about the field trips too. We have to really be thinking critically around what it is that we are exposing children to in our, whether it's pictures, posters in the classroom, statues, um, you know, yeah. when we are, our Canadian history has been one of propaganda. Um, yeah. And we're only just now as a, as an education system, beginning to uncover and reveal that there's a very different history that's that's gone on that the public have not been privy to. Um, and so I think that as educators, we have a responsibility to take on that learning 
Um, don't wait for it to become made mandatory or available. Do your own reading. Um, there's so much information out now that's available to better inform you. And then think critically around, you know, do an inventory in your school, in your classroom, uh, what's on the walls, whose voices are being represented. Are you incorporating, you know, what is the language of the land that you are living and teaching in? And um, are we centering those voices and those perspectives. And then the other piece I wanted to just comment on, because we've done a lot of work in regards to our organization and putting out guidelines, is that people uh, often uh, lean into or get kind of, and this is for non-Indigenous folks mainly, um, get enamored with the culture. And so we see lots of um, appropriation and misrepresentation and um, bizarre uh, interpretations of what people are thinking when they bring in what they think is Indigenous perspectives and there's this focus on culture and we've really tried to steer people out of the culture um, in terms of educators and you know the the new curriculum does actually focus does not focus on the cultural aspects um, that if you want to have those experiences that it has to come from those in the community who are qualified and have the knowledge to share that. It can't come from, um, you know, a non-Indigenous teacher trying to Google, um, you know, whatever it is, and then trying to replicate in their in that in their classroom. Um, so really making sure that we're, we're using the community um, people to help support what's happening in the classroom and then knowing kind of your place as the teacher, your job in terms of delivering the curriculum and bringing in, you know, the facts and um, and doing and staying in it's like the stay in your lane piece. So I wanted to add that on. Um, we're going to switch gears based on the questions here. Uh, so going in back to the chat box. Do you think the causes of all the deaths of Indigenous students in Thunder Bay was caused by discrimination in Thunder Bay? Or um, it says, or the schools, but I'm, I think maybe, maybe speak more broadly, I think to perhaps the systemic racism that exists. Um, yeah, this um, indifference can kill people and there has been a, there is a quiet racism that runs through Canadian society that has always been there. Um, a history of looking away, um, a history of, you know, there's, there's Canada for non-Indigenous people and there's Canada for Indigenous people. Um, indifference can kill, looking away kills. And I do not know, I can't profess to tell you who took the lives of the kids, but you should know that four of the seven fallen feathers are being, the deaths of four of them, uh, four of the boys that were in the water are being reinvestigated by a multidisciplinary task force, police task force. Um, I find it hard to believe that these kids just drowned and it's taken a long time for other people to finally realize that too. Sadly, basic investigative work uh, wasn't done at the time of their deaths and not just the students, but a lot of First Nations people's deaths in Thunder Bay um, and not just Thunder Bay, as we know, in communities all across this country. So lots, lots needs to change. And um, I, that's about the best way I think I can answer your question, but I'll turn that over to Alvin. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the hard truths we need to acknowledge and accept is that racism kills. And a lot of these, you know, the Indian Act, for example, you know, one of the most uh, racist and colonial policies that, um, that still exist in this country and all the policies that flow from that, including education today, how it's funded uh, in the Indigenous community. 
um, it creates inequity. It creates a dangerous situation for our students that do have to leave when they're 13 or 14. Uh, so I, you know, I think we all need to acknowledge that it's it flows from a very racist uh, piece of legislation, and that's why our children are still um, not where they should be. Uh, so I, I think that's something we we need to accept and understand uh, until all that Indian Act is done away with. Uh, you know that these inequities will continue to be uh, with us. Uh, in terms of the actual cause of death of these students here in Thunder Bay, uh, that's part of the reinvestigation work that is being done. I, I had I agreed to be a part of that. Uh, that uh, senior team that's overseeing the work and uh, we know that you know how Jethro died how he ended up in uh, a small hole in the ice in the middle of winter time how did that happen you know, and uh, as well as other uh, deaths that have happened here in Thunder Bay like why or how you know these are the questions that families still have even after the inquest and uh, I'm hoping that the reinvestigation that's being done now will hopefully provide some of those uh, to the questions that the, or some of the answers that the, the questions that they have been. Um, I was hoping that the work would be conc uh, concluded by July, but uh, I think with this pandemic, there's been some delays and um, I hope that the uh, work will conclude by, by the fall. Thank you. I think this kind of role, like the next question, Kind of along that same vein, can you talk a bit about the lawsuit that has not been settled by the government regarding child welfare compensation? Hmm. I wish Cindy Blackstock were here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can probably uh, yeah. yeah one of the one of the probably one of the best decisions that I made when I became a, a grand chief five years ago was uh, to seek standing to that very important case. Uh, even though AFN was uh, a party to that already, uh, Chief Zwantri was already uh, had intervener status because um, I, we felt that the stab escalation and, and the remoteness issues and the challenges that, that come with that would not be factor in or would not be included in, in the process. We felt it was important for us uh, as the Shabbos Nation to have standing. And the door was just closing at that time. And we made our application and we were approved. So we have been uh, a part of those proceedings uh, five years now. Uh, and that's why we, we've been able to, to carve off some very significant pieces uh, including choose life, including the how funding formulas are developed to begin to address uh, those inequities, and uh, um, it's a struggle. You know why does Canada think that they're above the law? That every time this tribunal makes a decision, they delay it or they ignore it or they just you know make technical arguments to try to avoid from actually doing the right thing, which is to implement the rules that have been made. So. That, that fight is still on and we're committed to we're committed to that uh, uh, moving forward. Thank you for that. And again, another if you're not aware of um, child welfare in terms of you know when we talk about residential schools, uh, there are more kids in care than you know that ever went to residential school and um you know they take they take babies from wombs right right from the womb so if you if you're not aware of that i really encourage you to dive into that issue and and look at you know what's happening with that um so another question here is many school boards offer uh indigenous and this is in quotes cultural competency training quote do you think the concept of cultural competency is possible or that this is a helpful approach in improving the system for Indigenous students? What do you see as a necessary as necessary learning for school administrators to make the system more equitable for Indigenous students? So there's a 
so it's kind of a two part question there. I guess if you want to first con comment, um, this is where we'd love to have Tisa's input. <laughs> um, but, you know, on first of all, cultural competency training, do you want to talk a bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Alvin. I think he could probably answer that uh, that better. I, I would just question who's doing the training, you know, who, um, who and where does the training come from? Um, it's difficult to do. So, yeah, it, that's, a, that's a tough thing to do. But, um, Alvin, since you live with TC, you can also answer this. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean it's it's not just in education; it's uh, you know it's needed in policing and and healthcare, um, and these institutions, whether it's a school board, you know, they need to make it part of their, you know, they need to incorporate that to their uh, overall mandate. That they need to support it, whether it's uh, education directors or uh, school boards, they need to be fully behind this. You know, they need to buy into this. It's so important that you, as educators or teachers in the classroom, feel that you are supported uh, by your school boards, by your supervisors, by your directors. That everyone is on board to make sure that there's, you know, the. Uh, that cultural piece, that cultural safety piece, is uh, you know should be integral in terms of how education is delivered in this in this province. And everyone, from uh, the minister of education to the directors to the supervisors to the teachers, they need to understand it and they need to uh, buy into it. And you know it should be just a natural thing moving forward that you know we shouldn't have to worry about cultural safety. That it should be built in into all these systems. Yeah, I think about like, why are we asking for basic human rights? Like just like we're trying to just get basic human rights. That's, that shouldn't even be an ask, but that's the ask, it seems. Yeah, yeah. I would just also add that, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's physically impossible to have elders in every classroom in every school in the province that, or to have Indigenous educators. Uh, I think that's where that non-Indigenous educators need to feel con some confidence that they can deliver this kind of curriculum. And that's where people like Tisa or yourself, Jody, that's where you come in is to uh, provide that support for, for all educators, uh, not just the Catholic school board, but the public school board right across the province that every teacher should have um, confidence that they should have training to deliver um, Curriculum on Secret Path or the TRC uh, you know, calls to action, or now with the uh, Missing and Murdered um, Indigenous Women and Girls, uh, the calls to justice. That you should know this, you should know what the treaties, what they are, and to be able to in incorporate that into the, the curriculum across the board. Not every teacher uh, should be able to, to have confidence in themselves without having to be gun shy talk about ceremony or you know that they should be able to uh to do that and and know that they're going to be uh supported by their board they're going to be supported by their supervisors by their directors and people like yourself uh, judy that we need more judy's we need more tisas in all these systems yeah. thank you so i i noticed i skipped over a question uh this is back to you tanya is your book Seven Fallen Feathers going to be available in French? Yes, it is. Oh, actually, oh it is already. No, nope. it's not true. Uh, sorry, the next one is All Our Relations is um, it's going to be available um, in Quebec in October in French. But no plans uh, right now for Seven Fallen Feathers to be translated, um, um, sadly. Okay. Uh, so the next question here, uh, can we unpack indifference a bit more? I think it is a powerful concept. What shape does this take on? How can we react and respond compassionately? Mm. Um, indifference is, is silence, right? Indifference is, is not standing up. Indifference um, is 
waiting on time. It's something that Martin Luther King used to talk about. Um, if you just have an attitude of, well, give it time, things will get better with time, um, and you don't stand up and do something that is being indifferent. Um, and you can look back at any progress that any society has made uh, across the world, and nobody sat back and waited on time. It took effort from people. It took effort from teachers. It took effort from uh, leaders to move society to a different spot, a different place to progress. That's what we're seeing now, I hope, with the uh, demonstrations across Turtle Island is that we're going to be moving forward. Um, but that's when we talk about indifference, um, that's racism. Indifference, there's no room for that. So we have to take the initiative and make sure that all of our allies are standing with us too, right? Um, we can pass all the legislation we want in the world. We can, you mentioned Jody Undrip was just passed um, federally. It was passed in BC and sadly that didn't do a whole lot of uh, help for the Wet'suwet'en people and the demonstrators there. Um, we can pass all the legislation we want 1964, the U.S. civil rights legislation was passed, but yet still see what we have. Um, unless the will of the people, the majority, are behind the actual changes in the spirit of the legislation and all the laws, nothing will change. It takes people to make change in every aspect, in every school, in every classroom, everywhere. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Elvin, do you want to add in? Yeah, just uh, quickly, I know we're running out of time here. Um, there was a, a march, uh, a Black Lives Matter march here in Thunder Bay uh, the other week, and uh, it was really heartening to see so many people turn out. I think there are estimates about 2,000 people showed up. Uh, many non-Indigenous people uh, and while it was great to see that uh, you know I would just encourage um, you know our white brothers and sisters our allies that this isn't just a fad you know that we're not asking you to make a three hour or four hour commitment out of your life to join a march uh, that you need to make it your business to be a part of that change, that systemic change, because it's not just a, an American or a black problem. It's very much in Thunder Bay, it's very much in the country. And uh, I, this morning I watched the video of the vicious beating by the RCMP of uh, one of our leaders uh, from Treaty 8, uh, Chief Alan Ar uh, Adam, yeah. who was beaten up because uh, mm -hmm. he had an expired stick it, uh, or a, an expired uh, sticker uh, on his uh, license plate. Uh, it's horrifying to see you know what's happening uh, in the East Coast and Nunavut with uh, you know just the racist uh, and the uh, the police uh, brutality that that we're seeing across uh, this country and that's where we you know we need allies like the, the, that's the message that I convey to the people here in Thunder Bay even though I was there officially that we need you to stand with us. Uh, for the long term, that uh, it shouldn't just be a Black Lives Matter march that you turn out every time, you know, there is a march for missing women, Indigenous women and girls, 100 people show up, and most of them are, are, are First Nations people. Or if there's a march to try to address what's happening here with kids dying in Thunder Bay, we don't see, you know, during the inquest that happened here, it was a 10-month proceeding, I went there as many times as I could in the courtroom. Not one time did I see a member of the Thunder Bay City Council come and listen to those proceedings. You know, that's that's cowardly. You know, so if you want to make change, you gotta be you gotta be courageous. You know, you have to be fear, fearless. Uh, and that's what I would encourage teachers to be across this province is even though it's not mandatory to do this or it's not mandatory to deliver this kind of programming, you just do it. 
I think those are such beautiful closing words even because we are coming to the end of our time here. And I know that there's a few other questions um, that have been posed, but I think to turn it back to our audience here and for everyone to be thinking about it, what am I doing? What can I do? What am I doing? How do I humanize this? What are the thing? What are the tools that I have at my disposal? How can I inspire my students to be courageous and fearless and to stand up and fight for what's right? Um, you know, I I get inspired. I love education because I get inspired by, you know, the kids at IT. I come from secondary and. You know, I love secondary because they're like at that prime rebellious stage of their lives. And so when you funnel that really good energy, it's incredible what, you know, the campaigns over the years that they've come up with and like they know kids know injustice. Um, and so how do we harness that? And you don't have to be an expert at this. Uh, there's another comment about um, there's so much to know. Yes. Uh, this is, you know, we we encourage this is a lifelong journey of learning, but don't stop. Um, continue to educate yourself. Come out to these sessions. Um, somebody had posted in the chat box. Read Unsettling Canada by Arthur Manuel is another fantastic book. Um, you know, continue to become educated in these in these in this area and and can and look to see what can you do for yourself. So I just want to. Um, final words from the two of you, any, you know, to kind of sum up or messages that you want to, to send out as we, as we carry on in this weird COVID world, but still in education. Um, keep, keep the, keep learning, keep doing what you're doing. And um, now's the time. Now's the time to stand up and we're stronger together. So we need all the allies we can. And as Alvin said, it's not just the marches. We need you every single day. Any oh, last words, Alvin? <laughs> no, it's, uh, uh, I just want to say miigwech. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to uh, speak with you all. And uh, the reason why I accept uh, these types of invitations is uh, uh, I know how important uh, educators are, their role. You know, you, you get a chance to influence young minds and kids' minds. And uh, Cindy Blackstock always talks about that when a child is from one to five or six, you know, that's when you can really influence who they will become as, as adults. And uh, you have that opportunity every day. And I hope that education uh, we'll resume in the fall. I don't know what that's going to look like, but uh, I just want to encourage you to um, do your job and do it well and really look at um, you know the opportunity that you have uh, to influence uh, children right across uh, the province and to uh, not cheat them by, uh, you know, by the way, the curriculum has, has been developed historically that we need to begin to make that uh, curriculum in a way that is is uh, uh, that honors the true history of who we are uh, as a nation, as indigenous peoples, that you, that's what you need to teach. And I would just encourage you, all of you, to do that. Amazing. I'm, ex I'm so inspired right now. By listening to the both of you and I just want to thank you again for sharing your time with us today and um, you know we will continue in the work that we do in our capacity um, and again thank you very much thank you to everyone who uh, joined us sorry about the technology issues it's always an issue in some capacity these days it seems um, but we have uh, we will share out this recording so the people that couldn't join us will have access to this and I uh, just want to um, I also want to acknowledge De Hande as well for being here with us um, he's part of our, our organization and council and does incredible work as well so uh, thank you everyone enjoy the rest of your day and Stay safe. Is you make Oh, me watch. Me watch. Bye, everyone.